If you could please take your seats, We're, we'd like to get started. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming this morning. It's nice to see so many familiar uh, faces and new and old friends. I appreciate you making the time to attend the DAPA CSIS conference on uh, Republic of Korea, United States, Defense Industrial Cooperation for a Resilient Supply Chain, which is a very important topic uh, in these days. I'm going to start off with uh, some safety language. Overall, we feel comfortable and convenient. Uh, we feel comfortable in this building, but as a convener, we have a duty to prepare for any eventuality. So I will serve as your responsible safety officer for this event. Please follow my instructions should the need arrive. And in the meantime, please familiarize yourself with the emergency exits, which are in the front, and there's also one here. Also, for safety reasons, if you have a backpack or a briefcase, if you could put it under your chair or under the table in front of you so that it's not blocking the aisles. Thank you. Also, on your headset, English is on channel 2 and Korean is on channel 10. That could be reversed, but in that case, it's always channel 2 and channel 10. So those are the ones to look for. Uh, let me start off by saying that Dr. Hamray sends his deepest regrets for not being able to be here this morning and kick off the conference. Unfortunately, he is recovering from uh, an illness and uh, uh, begged off, but I'm happy to say that Dr. Victor Cha will be offering the introductions of the first presenters as well as some opening remarks. So it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Cha. He is the Senior Vice President for Asia and the Korea Chair at CSIS. He is also a Vice Dean and Professor of Government and holds the D.S. Song K.F. Chair in the Department of Government in the School of Foreign Service at, the, at Georgetown University. Dr. Cha left the White House in 2007 after serving since 2004 as the Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council and was also the Deputy Head of the Delegation for the United States at the Six Party Talks in Beijing. Dr. Cha has an extremely long list of academic honors and fellowships, including multiple Fulbright Awards. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Fulbright Association. Dr. Cha received his PhD in political science from Columbia University, a master's in international affairs from Columbia, a master's with honors in philosophy, politics, and economics from Oxford University in the United Kingdom, and an AB in economics from Columbia. So Dr. Cha, we were looking forward to your opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, um, for that kind introduction. So again, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I uh, um, send regards from Dr. Hamry, who was not able to join us. He uh, really values uh, very much uh, our relationship with DAPA, uh, with, which we've had for um, several years now. Um, and this conference today on ROK U.S. Defense Industrial Cooperation for Resilient Global Supply Chains is probably the longest conference title that I can remember in recent history, but as Cynthia said, it's a very, very important and very, very timely, uh, very, very timely topic. Um, so as I said, we're, you know, CSIS, we've been very, very happy and fortunate to partner with DAPA over the years. Uh, we've, we've had a DAPA visiting fellow with us who's contributed greatly to um, uh, the, the community the intellectual environment here at CSIS, we're grateful for that. Um, and the goal of our cooperation is uh, really to try to foster, as this top, as this conference is trying to do, uh, greater U.S.-Korea uh, defense industrial cooperation and really push it into uh, the third generation. This is something that Dr. Hamry already always talks about. <clears throat> and when I think of this topic, I sort of think of three areas that I, that are, or three requirements for pushing this relationship in uh, industrial cooperation into the third generation. And as I was thinking of this, I was trying to think of a good alliteration for it, and I could only come up with two out of three. So 
Um, the things I think that are important are capabilities, uh, coordination, uh, and trust. I couldn't come up with the last C, so trust would be the third. Uh, in terms of capabilities over the years, you know, uh, the Republic of Korea really has shown um, the advancement, uh, really the spectacular advancement in their capabilities, making them more than a capable partner of the United States uh, in defense industrial cooperation. Um, we see these capabilities on display almost every day in the defense and the uh, deterrence on the peninsula and everything from missile defense uh, tracking to early warning systems. In fact, as we speak, the U.S. and the Korea, the two allies, are in the midst of major military exercises. I see former U.S. FK Commander Skip Sharp here. He knows these well, and I'm sure many of you have been a part of these. But, uh, but not just in this field, but as we'll talk about uh, over the next day, uh, in new growth areas of artificial intelligence, quantum, as well as space. Um, so the capabilities are strong. In terms of coordination, we've seen U.S. rock coordination on economic security and supply chain resilience issues in areas ranging from personal protective equipment, right, on the global health side to uh, memory chips. Um, and at a time when U.S. production is running at full capacity, uh, the Republic of Korea has enabled NATO allies by backfilling in places like Poland, the U.S. Army, uh, with equipment and munitions uh, as the war in Ukraine continues. The, the ROK has been a critical partner in sanctions on Russia, which has left the Russians searching for chips for systems to replace their losses. And of course, whether we're talking about quad work streams, whether we're talking about the CHIPS-4, whether we're talking about the semiconductor export controls, Korea's role is critical uh, in all of these areas. But here, though, the U.S. and Korea, while they have many areas of technical cooperation and coordination, um, one of the areas that we need to work on is coordination between sort of the top-level political and security goals and sort of the lower level, I wouldn't say the working level, sort of technical advances and capacity needs of both, of both countries. The final element is trust. Uh, here I would say South Korea is earning a reputation as a trusted supplier of military products to countries like Poland, Australia, the Philippines, in the civil nuclear energy space as well, with countries like UAE and other potential partners. And from the U.S. perspective, this is a good thing because Korea should and does maintain the highest standards in terms of the quality and the safety and security of these products, unlike uh, other potential suppliers in the global system. So that is, a, that is a good thing for the United States and for the alliance. And then finally, of course, of course, trust between the alliance partners should be on full display this year in particular as we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the alliance and, uh, and of course, in a, in a little over five weeks from now, the state visit of South Korean President Yoon uh, to the White House uh, at the invitation of President and Mrs. Biden. So, um, so uh, we look forward to a great conference. Um, over the next day, uh, we'll start with our keynote addresses by our two distinguished um, uh, participants. Um, and, and again, I thank, you, I thank you all for coming. So uh, please hold your applause, because uh, we're going to transition right now to our, our keynote addresses by um, uh, Minister Um and by uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Vaccaro. But please allow me uh, the opportunity to formally introduce them to you, even though you may, you may know them very well. Um, so first, of course, we want to welcome to CSIS and to Washington, D.C., Minister, Minister Om, Dong Juan, uh, who is Minister of Defense Acquisition Program Administration. He is a retired Army Brigadier General. Uh, who assumed office as Minister of DAPA in June of 2022. Uh, he is responsible for overseeing DAPA's extensive portfolio 
uh, force improvement programs, procurement of military supplies, and promotion of defense industry. He is a graduate of the KMA, the Korea Military Academy. Um, and after joining DAPA, he was also uh, uh, appointed as director of the main battle tank program team, where he had oversight of major programs for acquiring main battle tanks for the ROK Army. He then became director of acquisition policy division, where he oversaw policy and planning of force improvement programs. After being promoted to the rank of Brigadier General, he was appointed to the Director General of Maneuver and Firepower Program Department. And in this capacity, he was in charge of coordination and execution of acquisition programs for new maneuver and firepower capabilities. After his retirement from the military, he became head of the Defense Industrial Technology Center for the Agency for Defense uh, Development. Also joining us on the stage is Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Based Policy, Mr. Michael Vaccaro. Um, uh, as I said, he's Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Policy. In this role, Mr. Vaccaro leads and supports the DOD's efforts to develop and maintain the U.S. defense industrial base to ensure secure supply materi materials critical to national security. Prior to this position, he served as Acting Executive Director, International Cooperation, where he co-chaired bilateral forums with key European, Indo-Pacific, and Western Hemisphere partners and allies to further international research, development, production, and acquisition armaments cooperation. Mr. Vaccaro previously served as Director of the Office of Strategic Industries and Economic Security in the Department of Commerce, Bureau of, uh, Bureau of Industry and Security from 2013 to 2019. And in this position, he was responsible for implementing BIS's defense trade, industrial base, and foreign investment programs. Mr. Vaccaro holds undergraduate and graduate degrees from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and National Security Studies program. In spite of that education, he's managed to succeed in his career. Um, um, uh, unfortunately, we did not overlap during his time at Georgetown. Um, but Mr. Vaccaro is also a distinguished graduate of the National Defense uh, University's Industrial College of the Armed Services. Um, so I think um, we will probably start. I, uh, I, I don't know if you have talked about who will go first. Minister Ohm, would you like to start, or Mr. Vaccaro? Why don't we start with Minister Ohm, since Minister Ohm is our guest. So please, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, round of applause for our guest, Minister Ohm. Thank you. Washington DC에 도착을 했는데 그 윌리엄 프랑스 국방 획득 운영 차관님과 제임스 울씨 DAU 총장님 그리고 제임스 허시 DSCA 본부장님 네 따뜻한 환대와 그리고 건설적인 토의를 하였습니다. 다시 한번 세 분께 감사드립니다. So some of our delegation, they got cold, they are in pain. I hope you also take care of yourself in this early spring coldness. So I am going to read uh, my script. First of all, uh, respected President Henry of CSIS, I hope he recovers soon. And also, thank you all of you who are here today, and also those of you who are watching the conference online. I'd like to extend my gratitude to all. This one-day conference 
is held under the theme of Rock U.S. Defense Industrial Corporation for a Resilient Global Supply Chain. With the bilateral summit held in 11 days of the inauguration of the UN government last May, the shortest period ever, the importance of the Rock U.S. relationship is being emphasized more than ever. With such momentum, also the defense industry, also following that atmosphere, I find it very meaningful to have this venue to discuss the future of global defense supply chain bilateral cooperation on the defense industry. During the last summit, uh, Iraq and U.S. will face any challenges and it will develop its relations into capturing any opportunities before us. It seems that this message means that even amid the challenging environment of global supply chain disruptions, all the opportunities presented before the two countries are the opportunities for the ROC and U.S. cooperation. For when the U.S. pursuing cooperation with allies as a major strategy for stabilization of supply chain, the declaration in the joint statement that the two countries recognize that the potential for cooperation in defense industry is increasing and then safe, sustainable, and resilient global supply chain is based on such effort. This implies a lot of us, a lot to us. In this sense, the Rock U.S. defense industry cooperation is entering an important phase. I think that DAPA CSIS conference under the theme of Rock U.S. defense industrial cooperation for resilient global supply chain will be a great foundation for continuing this important momentum and further develop bilateral defense industrial cooperation as major government figures, experts, and businesses of the two countries exchange visions. Once again, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to CSIS to organizing this previous uh, pr precious venue. The Rock U.S. Alliance, which started for freedom and peace in 1953 based on the Korean War, marks the 70th anniversary this year. Yesterday, I laid wreath at the Korean War Memorial and the World of Remembrance. The freedom is not free uh, that was engraved on the wall and the honorable names of the 43,808 people who died as U.S. soldiers and Katusas resonates deeply in our hearts. Once again, thank you all uh, for the U.S. veterans who sacrificed their lives for the freedom and peace of a country that they have not known or been to. The Rock U.S. Alliance that marks the 70th anniversary, as the two presidents said, has been based on common sacrifice and refined through our deep security relationship and is continuously evolving and expanding with not only in security sector, but also key and emerging technologies and cybersecurity cooperation is deepening and expanding the alliance is evolving into a technology alliance. In other words, the Rock U.S. Alliance is maturing as a deep and comprehensive strategic relationship. Moreover, I look forward to seeing the Rock U.S. Defense Industrial Cooperation serving as one of the pillars of the such strategic relationship. As a reliable supply chain uh, participant, the Korean defense industry's growth and the expansion of global supply chain of the mature Korean defense industry will play such roles. Along with the Rock U.S. Alliance, the Rock U.S. Defense Industrial Cooperation also have matured. President Henry of CSIS, who was uh, who couldn't attend here today have proposed the concept of third generation Rock U.S. Defense Industrial Cooperation to Korea and DAPA in 2018. So far, the bilateral cooperation, starting with the first generation of defense cooperation where Korea was introducing U.S. weapon systems through U.S. military assistance, has gone through the stage of second generation defense industrial cooperation where Korea received technology transfer through offset and et cetera as Korea purchased the U.S. weapon system. Now it is time for us to move forward the third generation where we jointly do the overall process of joint development, joint production, and joint marketing of the weapon systems. As the Minister of DAPA, I would like to extend my greatest Sincere gratitude to President Henry for the proposal, and I fully agree with him. 
Moreover, I believe this is the most appropriate time to realize the third generation cooperation. I also think this is the most timely plan to respond to the calling of the time of the stable global supply chain and a sustainable cooperation plan that will go beyond the last 70 years of the bilateral relationship and drive the next 700 years ahead. DAPA, based on mature bilateral relationship of the alliance, has explored diverse plans to simultaneously realize both third generation cooperation and global supply chain stabilization. And today's conference, we have keynote speeches, public and private sessions, and we will uh, try to turn this venue into DAP, uh, a venue where DAPA will make proposals in diverse ways for bilateral defense industrial cooperation. As a reliable supply chain, the Korean defense industry will prove its credibility through SOSA and KCMMC establishment that are underway and ROC U.S. Defense Semiconductor Cooperation. Also, for expansion of participation in the global supply chain, the Korean defense industry will pursue bilateral cooperation defense technology through pursuing participation in U.S. FCT program and ROC U.S. military semiconductor and military space. I think such institutional support of the two government and technological cooperation will provide supply chain stabilization through cooperation with Korea, the U.S., and sharing of latest technology and participation in the global supply chain to Korea, and joint development and joint marketing and cost reduction and other mutually reciprocal results to both countries. The Korean government, as a major national agenda, has set ROC, U.S. Military Alliance Reinforcement and Defense Science and Technology Cooperation Expansion and preparation of virtual cycle of advanced weapon systems and acquisition and expansion of defense export. At the same time, DAPA established the vision of rapid deployment of up-to-date weapon systems and nurturing defense industry on the global state as its vision. Also, we're pursuing three goals of leaping toward to become defense science and technology powerhouse, shortening weapon system acquisition period, and size expansion of defense industry. In particular, in defense, for defense supply chain stability, Korea is preparing weapon system semiconductor development strategy in military semiconductor area and policies to nurture self-reliance in military semiconductor and also pursuing policies to nurture military space specialized companies. I believe that under the policy of cooperation and its momentum, if cooperation is in key technology areas, including military, semiconductor, and space, we can move on to sustainable and strategic cooperative relations. Moreover, the recent Korean defense industry, not only in line with the technological development of number nine in defense science and technology, but also in line with the quantitative growth, we're carefully contemplating on the specific roles of the Korean defense industry. The growth of the Korean defense industry is supported internally by the strong commitment of the government, active support of the military, and capabilities of our defense companies. However, that is not all. Just as in the history of the alliance, the Korean weapon system is manufactured in consideration of mutual compatibility and standardization of the U.S. and combined with the merit of strict verification in the field, including joint training, the capabilities of the Korean defense industry is highly recognized in the overseas market. Also, the growth of the Korean defense industry is expected to contribute to the peace and security of the international community, with more countries sharing the same weapon system as Korea. At the same time, while the national benefits to Korea through defense export is important, we also take universal value and philosophy of humanity importantly and are approaching this at macro level of sharing the international security. To, to contribute to stability of the international community and to successfully and continuously advance the bilateral defense industrial cooperation, 
it is needed to make joint efforts to deepen understanding on the mutual defense policies and develop cooperation areas for win-win base for doing this. And moreover, it is meaningful to have the first step of such efforts through this DAPA CSIS conference. Distinguished guests, including Deputy Assistant Secretary Vaccaro and distinguished guests. This conference is a meaningful event to remember the 70-year-old valuable bilateral alliance and to discuss ways for defense industrial cooperation. Once again, I would like to thank everyone here who participates in this conference and take time to listen to my speech. And I started, lastly, I would like to think we should remember Katsi Gapshida or Let's Go Together. This started from the conversation between two general officers during the Korean War, which was the start of the alliance and has become the slogan that emphasizes the alliance that is robust so far and show our determination about the future of the two countries. There's a saying that if you go alone, you can go faster, but going together, we can go farther. If the two countries go together on the path to the defense industrial cooperation, there would be nothing where we cannot go as a strong companions. Now, I would like to wrap this up by ch chanting the slogan, Katsi Gapshida, we go together. Come, thank you. Well, good morning, and it's um, my great pleasure to deliver a keynote address after Minister Am, and it's a hard act to follow. Um, we had the great pleasure of hosting um, Minister Am um, Tuesday at the Pentagon, and Dr. LaPlante, our Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment, looks forward to working with the Minister to strengthen U.S.-Korea defense cooperation uh, in the future. Um, I think if you got a little sense from my bio um, that I've been doing defense industrial base issues for almost 25 years right now. Um, but what you didn't hear was um, my last position um, before I joined the U.S. government um, doing defense industrial base issues. Um, I was working um, at 1800 K Street. And so um, if folks remember, that's where CSIS headquarters had been for a long, long time. But I was actually working for one of Korea's largest uh, trade associations. So um, I think that kind of highlights that I, I have a long-standing cooperation and understanding of Korean industry. And I've had the great pleasure over my career of working um, with Korean industry from the Korean side, but also from the U.S. government side and have the chance to visit a lot of your defense industrial capabilities. Um, what I was hoping to do this morning is sort of give an overview of what my job is, talk a little bit about the importance of strengthening um, international global supply chain cooperation. I'll highlight some of the specific initiatives that this administration has been focused on, touch a little bit about Ukraine, and then sort of end on you know, some of the, the initiatives we have ongoing right now to strengthen industry and industry collaboration with Korea. And I'm also on a panel afterwards, so we'll see how some of this. Um, we'll see. What I don't get during the keynote, we'll, we'll get to during the panel. But um, so if you met me, if you were meeting with me 18 months ago, um, I would have just been the director for international cooperation. And my responsibility would have been really focused largely on promoting government-to-government -government cooperation. And we have extensive government-to-government -government cooperation with Korea. Um, but our Congress... Um, had realized that um, it was important, the importance of the global defense industrial base. And, and at the Pentagon, uh, our industrial base policy team historically had been led at the deputy assistant secretary level. And our Congress directed um, the DOD to elevate that position to an assistant secretary position. And for those who aren't familiar with our system, um, typically are always an assistant secretary has to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate. 
And there's not that many assistant secretaries in the Department of Defense, so it hi is highlighting the importance of that mission set. And in fact, hopefully later today, our first full-time assistant secretary for industrial base policy will be voted on and confirmed by our Senate. So that's what we're expecting. Um, so as we're looking to um, increase this portfolio, if you will, um, there was a decision made by the department's senior leadership to combine my old international cooperation team with the existing deputy assistant secretary roles and responsibilities for industrial base policy. And, and the rationale was, and I was a huge champion of this idea, was when we're looking to engage with our partners and allies today, it's not, we can't segment, just have government to government cooperation. We, we need to be able to talk how go our government with industry and help foster industry to industry collaboration. And so that's what the decision was made in the new industrial based policy office was set up last April 1st. So we're almost a year in, in, in business right now. But again, I, I also wanted to highlight because some of our allies and partners initially were concerned that you know, maybe we were diminishing the importance of government to government cooperation by combining my team um, with the industrial based policy team. And it's to the contrary. The goal was we want to be able to engage on all these issues. And I think Mr. Om touched upon why that's really critical today. Um, I will say that I've been doing defense industrial base issues now for 25 years. And I have this administration by far has had the most attention on the importance of addressing supply chain concerns. And obviously COVID was part of that, but it was not all driven by COVID. Um, and I think that you will talk a little bit later about some of the steps we've been taking. But I, I just, again, it highlights that as we've looked at and experienced um, um, COVID and now Ukraine, it has re-emphasized the, the guidance we got from the department and from the president that we need to work internationally to address these concerns. And I'll touch upon some of those issues a little bit later. Um, from a leadership standpoint, um, ANS's priorities right now are delivering capabilities at speed and scale. We want to make sure we can deliver to the warfighter what they need, but we need to do it quickly. We need to protect and sustain the force, and we need to foster a resilient and robust industrial base. But key enablers to all three of those priorities are working closely with allies and partners. Now, you know, since this administration has taken office, we've issued a national security strategy. We've issued, a, we in the Department of Defense have issued our national defense strategy. Um, and now we've just recently released our budget um, request um, earlier this week and the last week. Um, and again, looking at all those strategic documents and the budget request, what is really emphasized, and I can't emphasize this enough, is that the need and the desire and the recognition that we need to engage with allies and partners. And if anything, that is what sets us apart from our potential adversaries, is our, and I'll say our meaning the United States and those of our allies and partners, robust technological and industrial base and our network of allies and partners. And I think just looking back what's happened over the past year um, you with Ukraine, I think why, one of the keys why we, and I mean we, the West, and our, our, our like-minded democracies in Asia, in the Pacific, um, why we've been able to assist Ukraine and have them have the success they have on the battlefield to date is because of our combined technological industrial bases and our network of allies and partners. Um, the budget requests that we issued uh, were released um, to Congress earlier this um, week. You know, it really highlights um, the importance of, you know, modernizing our force. And so if you look at what we've requested um, for research, development, and, and testing, and evaluation, and procurement, um, these are record high numbers. Um, and I will say that, you know, and I think Dr. Hicks made this point very clear uh, earlier this week, that you look at our budget requests, it's really lasered focus on China, but we also recognize and continue to recognize the acute threat by Russia, the DPRK, 
um, Iran and other violent extremist organizations around the world. Um, you'll see in the budget request, you know, significant investments uh, in the munitions accounts. Uh, I think one of the lessons learned from the past year um, has been the challenges in expanding or delivering munitions in a timely manner. Um, so you'll see significant increases in that. Um, also, there's money in the budget request specifically for helping to continue to expand our munitions industrial base capabilities. We're also asking for funding to support multi-year procurements of various munitions so we can deliver capabilities in a timely manner for our forces, but also those of our allies and partners. Um, we're also hoping this multi-year procurement authority will help send a signal to the defense industry. Um, this is a common theme we're hearing from industry around the world, is the, you know, it's hard to surge, but we need to see a demand signal. And so we're hoping that our budget request sends that signal. Um, stepping back a little bit to focus more on supply chains, um, when the president took office in 2021, uh, uh, a month after he took office, he issued what we call Executive Order 14017. And this executive order was a tasking to various departments in our government to study and report on vulnerabilities in our defense and in our supply chain writ large. And in particular, the Department of Defense was tasked to look at the defense industrial base. So there was really a series of two reports. Um, one was issued um, in 2021, um, 100 days after the executive order was initially re released. Um, I call it the 100 day dashes. And they were to look at snip snippets or snapshots of six sectors. And the 100 day dash that we were responsible for in the Pentagon was on uh, critical and strategic materials. And so we reported our findings. And then we had a year to complete the larger study on the defense industrial base writ large. So we released the findings of that study um, on February 24th last year. So I'm not sure if folks, I think most people will recognize that date, but that's the same day that Russia invaded, uh, continued its invasion of Ukraine. So um, needless to say, um, you know, I think the release of our report was not the front page story. But I want to kind of share a couple of the findings we had in the report. And I'll, I'll, I'll say in advance, the good news is um, we identified the vulnerabilities. The bad news is we were right about the vulnerabilities because we've experienced a lot of them over the past year. But, you know, in our report, how to shape a 21st century defense industrial base, we identified vulnerabilities in basically, you know, uh, five key areas. Um, the first area is kinetics. So looking at conventional munitions, future munitions. The second is energy storage and batteries. The third area was microelectronics. The fourth was strategic and critical materials, building upon what we had found a year earlier. And the last sector was castings and forgings. Um, we also looked at some key enablers that were relevant to all those sectors. One is workforce challenges. The second is cyber. The third was just developing future manufacturing technologies. And, and the last was really the key role that small business um, plays in promoting innovation. And we in the department are very concerned about the decline in the number of small businesses that are actually uh, competing and awarding, being awarded contracts. Yeah, I won't go, we came up with 64 recommendations um, and they were really in four different baskets. And they all start with I, so it makes it easy for me. But the first is internal. What could we, the Department of Defense, do to address these challenges? And so some sectors, like kinetics, we're pretty much dominate the market. So our ability to influence and make change is, is pretty strong, just the, just the department alone. But there are some sectors, and I'll use microelectronics as an example, where the Department of Defense 
accounts for a very small percentage of the market. We estimate about 2%. So in that area, we really need to work with the interagency, the U.S. government, whole government approach. And I think a good example of that is the CHIPS Act that commerce is leading to help um, reestablish or strengthen um, domestic microchip uh, capabilities in the United States. But there are two other eyes which are really relevant to today's discussion. The third eye is internationally. We realize these are shared challenges and that we need to work with our closest allies and partners to address these. Some have expressed concern that, you know, the EO uh, findings were suggesting that the United States was going to onshore everything. And, and that's just not realistic. So I, we, I like to refer to allied shoring or friend shoring. So this is an example where we need to work together. And as, you know, people here in the room know as well as I do, many of the sectors that I've just identified where we identified vulnerabilities, kinetics, energy storage and batteries, microelectronics, castings and forgings. I mean, these are all strengths of the Korean economy. So these are areas where we want to work together. The fourth eye is industry. We need to partner with industry to address these challenges. And when I say industry, I don't just mean U.S. industry. I also mean foreign industry. So these are areas that we're spending a lot of time we're now at the year, end, year mark of the executive order reports, and you'll start seeing in the coming weeks um, we'll be rolling out some of our initiatives. But one of the key initiatives we identified in our recommendations a year ago was our desire to uh, conclude more security of supply arrangements with key allies and partners. And as the minister highlighted earlier, we're hoping we'll have an opportunity to conclude one with Korea in the very near future. Um, I wanted to segue just a little bit on Ukraine. Um, so as many of you know, um, the United States has already delivered more than $30 billion of equipment to Ukraine. Um, I have spent most of my la the last year involved in how we can help from an industrial base standpoint, um, expedite deliveries to either Ukraine or replenish stocks. Um, we also established a special team within acquisition and sustainment specifically whose mission was to identify what can be done, steps could be taken to expedite production, backfill, our, and also work with our allies and partners. Um, some of the key issues that we've experienced have been long lead times, addressing parts obsolescence, capacity constraints, um, you know, and it's not just, you know, if you ask a prime contractor, a lot of times the prime contractors do not have complete visibility into all the, the tierings and where folks were sourcing um, components. And we've also found, unfortunately, that often you'd have maybe a fifth or tiff, sixth tier supplier um, who had, was capacity constrained to start with, um, and now is going to be a key supplier to multiple programs. So that's been a key challenge for us. Workforce challenge is another issue. And a reminder, this was all happening as we sort of, you know, wrapped, slowed out of the COVID, COVID wave. Um, we've worked together with the Army, the other services, um, to invest over $2 billion in the past year to help expand industrial capacity. Um, and that will continue to increase. And we've been lucky. We've got really strong congressional support to work in this area, including significant amount of money in the Ukraine supplemental to help um, expand our DPA, Defense Production Act, um, programs. But again, what we've recognized from the start was we need to be able to work with allies and partners in all these areas. You may have seen in the press today that um, our secretary and the chairman of the Joint Staff um, convened their latest meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group yesterday. Um, it was a virtual meeting in which more than, I think, 50 countries participated, including Korea. So we thank Korea for all your support you're doing in that forum. Um, we also recognized um, in about August or September of last year that it was critical that we look at it from an allies and partners standpoint, how we could work together to expand and work to expand capacity and to leverage each other's industrial base 
to deliver the capabilities that Ukraine needs today. So we stood up under our, um, my Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment, a, a national arms director um, level group. And we've had more than 45 countries participating in that event. Um, many are de delivering lethal aid to Ukraine. Some are delivering non-lethal aid. But we're all working together to share information um, and looking and seeing how we can expand production. And, and key areas we've been focused on, on are ammunition, um, but also sustainment. And so we're really welcome Korea's support for that work stream also. Um, br briefly on, I think one of the things that has been highlighted for the last two or three years experience, that the, the expectation that just-in-time delivery works has been challenged. And as countries around the world scrambled to find the equipment they needed to support, uh, respond to COVID, um, that we recognize that you know where something has worked in a normal peacetime environment may not work in crisis and i think that it's highlighted the importance of really getting a better understanding of who is in your supply chain and when you identify potential unreliable suppliers you at the very least identify alternatives or you work to find new suppliers um, so that's a big area. I, I think another area where we're very focused on right now and in engaging with our allies and partners is making sure folks understand, you know, if, if some, a foreign partner or foreign country is trying to make an investment in your industrial base or science and technology base, that you, you're aware of that and you have procedures in place to assess any national security implications. And so in the United States, we have what we call our Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. And I, I am I'm happy that many countries around the world, especially since COVID, are at the, either establishing similar procedures or strengthening existing ones. Because I think that, you know, clearly we welcome foreign investment in the United States, um, but it needs to be consistent with national security interests. And, you know, there's been concerns in the past with several transactions involving Chinese investments in the United States where the president or others have taken action that we've not allowed the transactions to occur. So I mean, that's an important aspect as we look at this new global industrial base, global defense industrial base, that we're only as strong as our weakest links. And it's important that everyone has an understanding of where these things are. Um, Maybe I'll just cl close here with the, the importance of working industry to industry. And that was a, a big theme with the minister. And I think Dr. Hamri's um, remarks, his vision um, actually is, is very sound. And I think to a certain extent that's already occurring to many examples. But the minister mentioned um, the foreign comparative test program. And uh, this is a great example of programs that the Department of Defense has where the mission is, is to scout out and identify foreign capabilities that may be able to satisfy our requirements. We also have teams around the world, the services, um, whose mission it is, is to scout technology that foreign uh, companies may have or the governments are working. Um, and, and that's their whole mission. And in fact, some of them may lead to government to government cooperation, but some actually just may, may lead to um, the Department of Defense or the services helping fund research, including in academia. So that's a great example. Um, Korea, I've had the pleasure of meeting um, with many of your defense companies um, in person and visiting some of your facilities. And as, as the minister highlighted, I think a lot of this cooperation um, started um, probably as related to offsets. Um, and the U.S. government position is that offsets are um, really industry. We have a, the government has a hands-off relationship. Um, but we do recognize that um, that has been a key to um, a lot of cooperation. But I think we've already started seeing um, examples where industry to industry collaboration um, has, you know, obviously supported Korean requirements, um, but also it, it helps um, propel Korea's success in the international marketplace. And, and the sales to, um, recent sales to Poland um, and Malaysia that have been announced also are great examples of that. In my old job at Commerce, I processed a lot of export licenses for less sensitive military items. 
and Korea was one of our top destinations. Um, and again, these were a lot of them who were going into Korean indigenous programs, which were satisfying ROC requirements, but also around the world. Um, and, and, and I think I'll just leave it maybe passing one last remark. Um, you know, we, we've, we welcome stronger collaboration. We also rec uh, welcome recommendations from groups like this, uh, this conference, but also industry to industry collaboration. And I know I've had the privilege to speak at the U.S.-Korea Defense Consultative Committee um, many times in the past in previous capacities. And that's a great existing forum where industry to industry gets together and provides remarks. Um, Minister Ong mentioned um, the 70th anniversary of our alliance. Um, when we met at the Pentagon two days ago, at the end of the meeting, he presented Under Secretary Plant uh, a, a pin. It was with a 70 on it. And, and actually, it reminded me of an experience I had um, during one of my last um, trips to Korea. And it was um, during one of the, the air show, the Seoul air show. And I was taking the subway from the air show to actually go speak at the U.S.-Korea Defense Consultative Committee um, event. And um, I'm taking the subway, and I, I noticed uh, an elderly gentleman uh, get on the subway, um, and he was having some difficulty walking. And, um, and I was traveling by myself, and he sat down across from me. Um, and he kept looking at me for you know, three or four stops, um, and I wasn't sure why. Um, and then um, we were approaching a stop, and he got up, and I was assuming that, you know, he was, this was going to be his exit, but he crossed the aisle, and I was wearing a U.S.-Korea pin, and he came up to me and pointed, started jabbing, and he goes, thank you, and um, I said, sir, I, and he goes, no, no, you, you're not, you, we are, Korea exists today because of the United States, thank you, and then he got off, and um, got off the subway, and I, I travel a lot, many, visit many countries and ally, partners and allies around the world. That's the only time that's ever happened. So again, I think it highlights the special relationship we have. And I look forward to working more with DAPA and with industry to even strengthen it further. So thank you. on the uh, audience, um, please think of any questions you might want to ask uh, our, two, our two guests. Let me start off by um, um, picking up where Michael left off. You mentioned that um, there is a, you know, in, in part because the external environment has forced the United States to really operate at full capacity in almost every respect. Um, uh, I know you've mentioned this, but perhaps you could say a little, a little bit more about how that has affected and impacted the way the United States is, is thinking now about um, the importance of our allies and partners, in, whether it's backfilling, whether it's in terms of um, um, uh, uh, joint research and development going forward, and then also how the United States is thinking about how to make it easier to cooperate with our allies and partners in these areas. So. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, if you looked at the timing of our, our national defense strategy, which was released, I think the confidential, the classified version was released last March. Um, and the unclassified version was released, um, I think, in October. Um, and so it was largely written before uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But even, you know, if you look at the draft of that document, the public version, it really highlights the importance of working with allies and partners. And, and the United States wants to be the partner of choice. And we can't envision a circumstance in the future where we're not operating with partners. And to do that effectively, we realize that we need to ensure that our partners have the capabilities that you want and that we want you to have if we're operating together, right? And so um, you'll see references in the national defense strategy to all those points, but also the recognition that um, some of the practices within the department make it difficult to get to yes by system. And so um, 
I'll give you one example which we, we try to address but uh, fix, but it hasn't always been fixed. But you know, just our default when we're drafting a classified document. Um, you know, you, you put down and say it's secret, and then you're supposed to say it well, could be released to various countries. And almost 95% of the classified documents that I saw in my first couple years at the Pentagon would say secret, no foreign. And that's actually a misuse of that application because there's this just the special circumstances on when you say no foreign. Um, and actually, the deputy, uh, Dr. Hicks actually issued a directive, or I, the Undersecretary for Intelligence and Security actually issued a directive or guidance memo um, last fall to try to address that. And that actually was identified as a challenge as part of our review of the national defense strategy. So something simple like that. But it also implies larger, you know, from a, t a tech security standpoint and an export licensing standpoint. I, I think that we're at a point right now that we recognize that we need to at least, at least be more open um, to exploring how do we get to yes as opposed to no. And We've, had, we've been through this experience before um, to a certain extent, um, and, and we have made changes. I'll, I'll go to like the industry, the industry side a little bit. Um, you know, in the Obama administration, um, we did a comprehensive um, reform of our export control system, and it was called export control reform. And, and as part of that exercise, we looked at and looked through the State Department list of controls, the U.S. munitions list, and identified what items provided a critical military or intelligence advantage. And those are the ones that we wanted to be able to see review on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, so those became the new USML. And it was, I think, 12 of the categories were completed during the Obama administration. The last three were completed during the last administration. Um, but then what we did is then we kind of moved the less sensitive military items to commerce jurisdiction. And because we had a more flexible export control ability of commerce that we could, didn't have to treat all countries equally. So Korea, for example, w benefited significantly because a whole host of um, um, items, especially after sales support, spare parts, um, that you were key to, to maintain the systems you have, um, but also critical as you um, developed indigenous programs and exported them to other countries, um, a lot of those systems, you didn't even need a license anymore to get to Korea. Um, so it was a great example. Um, but I think we realize now that that was great, but we need to build upon that. And so we're definitely looking um, internally how we can be more flexible on releasability, recognizing that we can't always get to complete yes, but how can we get closer? Uh, the other thing that high, was highlighted in the NDS, and we've recognized this as a longstanding challenge, is... Um, Historically, we build a weapon system or develop a weapon system, and then late in the process, ask ourselves, what changes do we need to make or modifications to make the system exportable? And that can be really, really hard further down the procurement or acquisition cycle you are. Um, so that's another area where we're looking to see what we can do more earlier in the process. I'll also say that, you know, I think there's been some press reporting on this, is that, you know, we realize that our foreign military sales program um, it, it may have such certain challenges. And so we, we have an internal review ongoing um, on how we can make that system better, too. And again, it's all about the guidance we're getting from the secretary and the deputy secretary, um, you know, consistent with guidance that we're getting from the White House is, it's critical that we do more with our allies and partners. Um, so from everything from the tech release, exportability, um, delivering capabilities, and then on the industrial base side, um, again, we're, we've recognized that you know, our industrial base had not been built to surge. And we need to be able to leverage our allies and partners and get sort of a better sense of what your demands may be but also how we can work together to um, address these common challenges, whether they be further down in the supply chain or if they're, for the example, the, the 155. So, um, so that's sort of where, let's just start with. That's terrific. Um, Minister Ohm, I, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well from the allies and partners perspective. 
the United States clearly um, is looking to allies and partners, um, you know, in these times, given, uh, given all of the needs on the uh, surge capacity side, as well as, they th as we think forward to sort of multi-year procurement, things of those natures. What, from a Korean perspective, um, how, how receptive is Korea to this? And what sorts of things does, would Korea like to see to make this process of cooperation easier? Yeah. Okay. So on the third generation partnership, I think this is the direction we need to pursue. Third generation uh, defense industry partnership might be the final image of what you are asking about. Well, currently, the United States and Republic of Korea, as we do this cooperation on defense industries, uh, like Mr. Vaccaro just mentioned about FMS or FCTs through diverse systems like that, uh, uh, with the United States and also Republic of Korea, we are trying to have resilient and stable supply chain. We have made efforts to that direction, but we cannot say that uh, the current status is like perfect. However, I think that third generation partnership, I think that will be the motivation to go toward third generation partnership, and we think that we have laid foundation for that. Well, Republic of Korea, with regard to the question you just asked me, we're trying to become a trustworthy supply chain, and we're trying to play that role going forward, and we think that it's important for us. And also today, as we do this conference, I think we're trying to, uh, we're trying to say and commit ourselves that we're going to play that role going down the road. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> One of the other things that you mentioned um, in both of your statements is, uh, and we're seeing it in practice now, as you said, with 155s and others, is you know, there's, a, there's a real demand on the U.S. side for increasing our capability on the munitions side. And so I guess the simple question there is, you know, we, we can do things with our industrial base, but partners like Korea, what role can they play in that sort of area? Well, I'll say that um, our U.S. Army colleagues in, uh, have been scouring the world right now, um, acquiring um, ammunition both from U.S. suppliers but also overseas, and, and vice versa with our allies and partners, um, especially for those that are supporting the contact group. So um, we welcome um, the support we have been able to get from Korea, so we really appreciate that. Um, we're also looking to see and, and recognizing that certain countries around the world um, may not be in a position to provide a direct lethal aid, uh, but if there's ways they can, you know, there's various components as you make various types of ammunition, and whether some partners may be able to help backfill or help uh, provide key components that are of constraint. Um, one example is just the casings for, you know, um, for shells. Um, there may be, you know, the, the U.S. uses a supplier. Um, there, there may be other countries around the world, um, and our supplier is pretty much maxed out. There may be other countries around the world who may be able to provide similar type of capabilities. So that's part of what we're trying to do is um, put um, the pieces of the puzzle internationally together, how we can uh, make more munitions. I will also say that one example, one thing the 155 has highlighted um, is that not all 155 rounds are equal. And the whole idea of going forward as you, you, as you look for, is there ways to better standardize? And, and part of that is really from the requirements process. And uh, I think that's going to be an area where we, we need to look more, um, how do we um, better utilize? Um, the other thing, too, is just from an industry standpoint, you know, and I think it's, you know, we, we've been hearing industry say we needed a demand signal. Um, I'm hoping that the multi-year procurement authority sends that great demand signal. Um, also, I think the orders and what you saw in our budget request to expand munitions capabilities. And I mean, you're also seeing it around the world. And um, you know, we'll see what the European Union does this week or next week. Um, but there is a lot of countries around the world who I think um, the past year has been a significant wake up call for. Um, and, um, but now the challenge as multiple countries try to expand, um, I think um, why it's even more important 
that we have security of supply arrangements and an existing dialogue is um, I, I can envision circumstances where we're all relying upon a the same supplier further down in the supply chain. And we may not be aware of it today. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example, and it's independent of um, Ukraine. So it was maybe five or six years ago. Um, and I was uh, in Seoul uh, meeting with one of Korea's largest defense companies. And I was there wearing my export control hat, and I'm with my assistant secretary. And we're in the boardroom, and um, the company puts up what they think is their number one issue with the United States. And my assistant secretary looked over and had no idea what it was. I did, because it was about, um, there was a simple component um, that a company outside Philadelphia made in the United States, and the unit cost for this component was two cents, two cents. Uh, but it was a critical component in a lot of U.S. precision guided munitions, and they were having a major supply chain challenge. What I wasn't aware of, that it was also a critical component in Korean munitions that this company was relying upon. So it's another, it's a real world example where someone who's not even our visible supply chain, you know, a fifth or sixth tier supplier can be critical to a whole bunch of different countries without us even aware of it. But uh, again, and, I, and that was even before Ukraine, that was in peacetime economy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, uh, the next question is for really, really both of you, and, and, um, and that is the extent to which, uh, y you know, in cooperation, industrial cooperation between the United States and Korea, we're looking for ways to make it easier, we're coordinating better, um, but I wanted to really ask you both to address the whole question of vulnerabilities in those supply chains. And um, and the map how you as a has how you coordinate mapping out what those vulnerabilities might be. You we may rely on the Korea, on Korea for something, but there may be a vulnerability in Korea's supply chain that we're not aware of. So I'd love to hear both of you talk about vulnerability of supply chains in industrial base uh, uh, capacity building. Yes, so like you said, a, a single very small system can make it or not make it, make it happen or not with the whole system. So it can be very fatal or very critical to the overall system. That's something that we experience every day. So among the allies, I think we need to have stabilize the supply chain. I think that just reiterate such message. Well, last year and this year, if you look at the security situation going on, it's not something that we have experienced before. It's very new adventure, new situation. But even if like Korea and US, we are allies and we are also trying to have stable uh, supply chain. Like you just said, there can be this very small, like two sets, very small components that can be an obstacle to exercising the capacity of the two countries. I think such problems will never go away. However, even such problems, we're trying to resolve them through the efforts that we are making today. We're trying to overcome them. And also, we are trying to make a trustworthy supply chain, and we're trying to deepen them. And I think such activities will, if that such activities will expand and deepen, I think we'll be able to minimize such risk. And like I said in my speech, semiconductor, the military semiconductor, I mentioned military semiconductor in my speech. Well, Korea is producing this precision uh, weapon uh, system, and I, we think that uh, semiconductor is very gaining importance in that weapon system. Since I was inaugurated in the Korean weapon system, uh, I think to enhance the trust to that system, in the end, we need to have highly credible 
military semiconductor. I need to. We think we need to expand the use of that so that we can raise the overall credibility of the weapon system. And we think we are trying our best to find solutions for that. Also, I think the uh, United States have diverse uh, weapon system through uh, the supply chain of allies across the world. And we are also under the same environment. And to improve on that, I think we need like a lot of efforts from the ally side as well, and also very tight coordination in maintaining the relationship and also execution. Yeah, I think one of the experiences, I think from, uh, we have a lot of industry representatives here too, and um, there's many, many companies right now around the world who are um, marketing supply chain illumination tools. And so I think that that is, um, and each tool has its own strengths and weaknesses, but I think that everybody realizes now that, you know, um, just-in-time delivery may not work, and you may think it works until you find out that, you know, a key supplier three or four tiers down um, is someplace that's um, not that stable or, um, you know, a different country that may not be a reliable supplier. So we in the Department of Defense have really recognized that this has been a challenge. Um, you know, very specific programs at times, we've done deep dives, um, but we're actually starting it, kicking off an initiative right now to um, really um, collect a whole lot more data on a, a host of weapon systems to get better visibility on where our key sources are. And we're sharing uh, what, our, what we're, our approach is um, with a lot of allies and partners um, and with NATO because I, I think that we're all facing these and we'd welcome the opportunity to have further discussions with Korea as we're doing this. Um, I think another key enabler, and I, I made a, veil, a, a reference to it during my remarks, but the, um, the importance of having mechanisms um, to address foreign ownership and control and influence, foci, um, whether it's um, you know, uh, foreign employees from countries that may not be uh, trustworthy, and I'll use China as an example, or Russia as another example, um, but also ownership. And, um, you know, and, that, and that's really important. In the United States, we um, strengthened our foreign investment um, authorities um, several years ago, and the president issued an executive order earlier this year, even providing more guidance to our Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States of patterns that we need to consider that could be threats to our national security. So I think that's really important. Um, and then cyber. I think cyber is another example where we're only as strong as our weakest link. And it's critical that we have good, all our industry and governments have strong cyber hygiene because the, the potential adversaries out there, you know, are savvy. And they, they realize that, you know, maybe the defense primes, they can't access the data through the primes but they'll try to get it through lower tiers. And there's a lot of data that may be on a third tier or fourth tier supplier's um, data systems, um, and they may not even realize they're a t potential target. And I like to tell stories, but I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, I was leaving the Pentagon, and it was on Christmas Eve, or a day before Christmas Eve, the 22nd, 23rd. And I'm halfway to my house, home, halfway home, and my phone rings, and it's a colleague of mine from our Treasury Department. And our Treasury colleagues are responsible for involving licenses to like um, entities, like designated entities who may be involved in bad actors. Um, and my Treasury colleague was calling me because they had just been reached out by a US supplier who supported some of our sensitive programs who just been victim of a ransomware attack. And, you know, and the question was, you know, how do we respond to this? And long story short, we did not authorize the issue of the ransom. But that's an example. It was somebody low down in the supply chain who thought they had good cyber hygiene, but, did, but they still were attacked successfully. And, um, but we need to be able to, in our, the pipeline is another example where we had the pipeline shut down. Um, but we need to work together on uh, making sure that, again, we're, we all have, uh, can share basic cyber hygiene and there were confidence that information that we share, um, either with export controls or government to government, is properly protected. Because again, I think the activities of the last couple of years have just highlighted that China and other countries are just sucking up a huge amount of data 
not just from the United States, but from other countries around the world. Um, and I know that Korea's had examples where they've had uh, foreign investors take over companies who are sort of important in your defense indu or industrial base, take all the IP, and then shut down the company. So, you know, those are the types of stuff we want to prevent from happening. Mr. Um, would you do you have any comment on this particular issue, or should we just go get some questions from the floor? <laughs> Among what you said, uh, we have a different levels for contractors, but fifth and sixth tiers and below, and their components. Uh, we need to figure out where their source, but it's not clear sometimes, and we cannot trust a lot of it still. And those are still not so much clear to us. This issue is uh, shared not just by us, uh, by other allies of the United States. And that was mentioned and that was emphasized uh, during your remarks, and we think this is a very serious issue. And you also touched upon cybersecurity issue. We are a government entity, but our defense businesses and their security and cyber attack uh, prevention measures, we do, we are trying to establish a complete system for them, but unfortunately we don't have enough budget to do that. That is our current uh, biggest challenge. But we need to gather collective wisdom amongst our allies and partners so that we can uh, jointly uh, uh, ch deal with this. And we need to find a joint solution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, I agree. I think the, when we, you know, we're trying to study supply chains in a way that we've never had to before. And, uh, and, and especially when we're talking about secondary, third order suppliers. We don't know where their, you know, and their second and third order suppliers. We don't know where those things are coming from. So this idea of sharing supply chain illumination techniques it sounds like a very good one. And on the cyber side, you know, I, I I agree. I mean, part of it is a budget cyber defense. Part of it's a budget issue. But as we know, in many of these cases, when it comes down to it, you can have as much protection as you want. But if there's human error, mm -hmm. if there's human error. There's human error, and you can't really, in many ways, you can train for that, but not always defend against it. Um, in the limited time that we have remaining, I thought we'd now go to the floor. If anybody has any questions, please um, feel free to raise your hands. I don't know if we have a mic. Do we have a mic? Uh, yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, oh, there's desk mics. So please use the desk mic so you can be heard. Yes. Um, Hi, uh, uh, thank you so much for these presentations today on the government level, they're very useful. I'm Jim, uh, Jim Grisella and sitting next to me is the CEO, CEO of our company, Delta One LLC. We specialize in working with Korea SMEs primarily, which are very important given the fact that the major companies in Korea, the big companies, have really uh, become global suppliers. They're great global suppliers. One of the things, and we work probably right now with 10 strategic uh, first and second tier suppliers in Korea, and one of the things that, one of the things that we're finding is the different, which might, might be helpful from the U.S. We also work with uh, the biggest uh, U.S. companies such as Lockheed, Boeing, Raytheon Technologies. The challenges that the Korean companies are facing right now in supply chain are specifically related to the time it takes them to be integrated into the global supply chain. I can say without question, it takes a minimum of four months, but most likely six to eight months for that process to be completed by these big companies. And I know it's frustrating to DAPA. I know it's frustrating to CRIT. And so that's an area that I would strongly suggest that maybe CIS can take a look at. The time, you know, because the U.S. companies, what they have done, and I can say this because I worked in U.S. the U.S. aerospace and defense industry for 25 years as an, a senior director. The biggest challenge that they face are some of the uh, areas of due diligence and compliance that 
all companies have to go to to be integrated into that global supply chain. That is a huge challenge for Korean companies. Now on the Korean side, the biggest challenge for U.S. companies is still the offset guidelines in Korea. They are so outdated that they don't reflect what you're trying to accomplish on a government-to-government -government basis. Again, I can say without question that many U.S. companies say, we're so frustrated with these guidelines that we'd rather go other places, other countries where we don't face these barriers. We want to do true industry-to-industry -industry cooperation. I'm not saying ditch the guidelines, but what I'm saying, please, on the Korean side, take a look at those guidelines. How can you make them more relevant to what you are trying to do at the policy level? So any comments on that? I think the audience might be interested in hearing your comments, Mr. Vitaro and, and Mr. Minister. Um, yeah, so part of my responsibility, my team's responsibility is, um, is actually encouraging more small business participation in the U.S. system. And we just actually, um, we just released a new small business strategy um, like last month. And because um, we're really concerned within the department that the number of companies that are awarded, small business that are awarded contracts has dropped significantly over the past decade. And, and we don't know why. And so, um, so that's a real challenge for us because we recognize that a lot of the sources of this innovation is the small business guys, right? That's, that's what you want. And so, um, so we're working on that and we'd be happy to share. And, and I'm not sure, as familiar with the Korean system, but in the US system as the US companies here are well aware, we have actually targets that, you know, your certain percentage of our DOD contracts are supposed to be um, either uh, awarded to small business or disadvantaged business in various categories. And those targets have actually been increasing under this administration. So, um, but we, that's a key priority for us. Um, I have been in meetings with the uh, US Korea uh, DIC to talk, um, and I've heard the conversation on um, offsets. And as again, as a US government employee, you know, um, our official policy is that offsets are um, markedly inefficient and economically distorting, and we defer to industry on how to and whether or not to execute or participate in offsets. That being said, what we've told foreign governments is that if you're going to have offsets, you should do it in a transparent manner. You should provide flexibility to industry that they can make a long, long uh, business case as opposed to transaction to transaction. So, if you're going to do that. Um, I also, in full disclosure, was in charge of, in my old job at Commerce, the annual offset report to Congress. So I've, I've got some history with this. Um, so uh, on the point you made about um, uh, companies maybe transferring work out of Korea, um, I, I will say that, you know, I, looking at how the U.S. Korean defense industrial base cooperation has evolved, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of it was related to offsets to start with. Um, and I think in an ideal world, you know, U.S. companies who have invested time to develop a relationship with a Korean supplier would like that Korean supplier to be part of a longstanding business case. That's what you're looking for, right? You invested this time. You don't want it to be transaction, transaction specific. And um, I've met with some medium-sized Korean companies, um, you know, visited their facilities, and ask in supporting major U.S. primes, and asking how did your work start with, and they say it was offset to start with. I said, "Oh, you're still subject to offset transactions." No, no, no. We've evolved beyond that. I've also visited Korean companies where they're highlighting work that's offset related, you know, and I said, "Oh, so how long have you been doing this?" Oh, eight or nine years. Oh, good. This is longstanding business. No, we're going to lose this work. This work is now being transferred to India to satisfy another offset requirement. So that, that is a key because there's a lot of countries around the world who want work. And I didn't even mention uh, MRO support. But you know, those are also areas, especially as we're looking at the geographic environment right now. You know, does it make sense for us? And, and Korean industry is supporting a lot of our forces already. Um, but that's another potential growth opportunity 
but there's a lot of countries around the world right now who want, are trying to chase that business. Some who have already well established, but other new entrants in that. And so Korea's got to be cognizant of that uh, as they're look going forward. They want to make sure that they foster an environment where it'll help strengthen U.S.-Korean industrial collaboration, not deter it. Minister, um, I'll give, we'll give you the last word for the session. Uh, about your question from the floor, I'm very familiar question uh, coming at me from the Korean companies. It's their, uh, one of the big challenges. And that made me think a lot uh, about it. Korea's SMEs with uh, great capabilities are having hard time entering into the U.S. market. The process is long, process is complicated, and we totally understand, and we are trying to improve that process, but it's not going well, unfortunately. And as you mentioned, they're rather trying to turn to civil uh, businesses, and I've seen a lot of them trying to do that, actually. And offsets, is one of the dilemmas that we have from the government perspective. Offset is allowed for uh, the amount above the certain uh, line, but the uh, results of the offset implementation, et cetera, and speed is the most uh, important, but then the realistic aspect of it is a little bit uh, lacking. But today, we're talking about resili resilient supply chains uh, at this conference. This resilient defense supply chains, when we're creating it, all the problems that we're talking about are slightly different. It has a different slant than what we're talking about here. Uh, for Korea's capable SMEs, are trying to uh, get recognized as a trusted uh, supply chain participant. That is important. And they do good business with them. That is also important. And the stable defense supply chain and maintenance of that is also very important. These values should not conflict. And we need to coordinate that process. So DAPA is uh, taking and playing that role. So from uh, based on your question, we will review that. And from the discussions uh, today, we would like to search for some great wisdom to solve that uh, problem. I'm sorry that I can't give you the direct answer, but hope that answers your question and concerns. Thank you very much to both of you for setting up the discussion for the rest of the day. Please, a round of applause for our two <laughs> distinguished speakers. caffeine out there and uh, we'll reconvene in 15 minutes. Thanks, sounds great. Oh, Terrific. Sorry, Terrific. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, the last year has highlighted why it's Yeah, it's, it's quite changed the environment. It's really but, changed the environment. But I've been yeah. championing, I've been wanting to do a security supply arrangement with Korea for over 15 years. So I'm really excited that we're, this is, and that's another indication, we'll talk maybe in the next panel, but it sends a signal to our industries that we want to cooperate. Yeah. And it could yeah. also be a tool that your industry can do to highlight certain sure. capabilities, yeah. especially yeah. small and medium size. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. He's yeah, he's on that. Yes, he is.
our presenters and panelists for our second session on uh, ROK US government to government policy for building a reliable defense supply chain. And as we heard in our first session, while this topic may have been uh, a back burner issue for many people pre-2020, it has since jumped to the top of almost every single discussion we have. And so I'm happy to be part of trying to uh, elicit insights and figure out how to pull us forward in that regard. And fortunately, we have two excellent panelists and presenters, followed by four uh, very well-positioned commentators. I will introduce first the presenters, and later we will get to our panelists and commentators. So first, we have Mr. Yoon Chung Moon on my left. He's the Director General, International Cooperation Bureau for the Defense Acquisition Program Administration of the Korean uh, Ministry of National Defense. And there, he leads a bureau responsible for formulating policies concerning cooperation with international partners uh, and allies. He oversees efforts to promote international engagements to facilitate defense and industrial partnerships with foreign governments. Um, his bio is extensive. He's had many leadership roles. I won't go into each and every one of them, but a quick taste. Uh, his responsibilities include uh, contracting and management of FMS, foreign military sales, with the United States. He has previously led the DAPA robot program team, the main battle tank program, and the advanced technology program. He is uh, very experienced in this area, and we are looking forward to his remarks. And potentially uh, of most interest to some of us in the audience, he was here at CSIS a number of years ago. Is that correct, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. Welcome back. <laughs> so briefly, following uh, Mr. Yoon's presentation, we will hear from Mr. Vaccaro, again, Michael Vaccaro, who is, as you heard earlier, uh, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Based Policy, uh, an increasingly critical role as we are looking to the future. And he was very well introduced earlier, but in case you're just joining us, uh, he leads the Defense Department's efforts to develop and maintain the U.S. defense industrial base uh, and to ensure secure supply of material critical to national security. Um, he's held numerous senior positions in both the Defense Department and in the Commerce Department before, uh, as I understand it, a career engaging with uh, Koreans from the outside as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So with that, let me turn it to Mr. Yoon for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, 예, 어, 방금 저 소개받은 어, 방위사업청 국제협력과 윤창, 윤창문입니다. 어, 제가 그러니까 소개해 주신 것 같이 제가 2017년 like 12월부터 1년 동안 I was a visiting fellow to CSIS so it's like five years ago and I can see that during that time there was a lot of issues in the international stage and a lot of changes in this important time I'm going to I am here to talk about this important topic today so today we're going to talk about evolving global defense industry landscape rock US corporation defense procurement and rock US corporation cybersecurity and also the roles of each stakeholders First of all, the evolving global defense industry landscape. Uh, basically, the defense industry is about having uh, having limited suppliers. And on top of that, from 2020, due to COVID-19 pandemic, there were crisis of supply chain. And last year, there was this war in Ukraine, which is ongoing, which made this uh, supply chain crisis a more realistic crisis to us. Last year in May, there was this bilateral summit meeting. And in order to strengthen the our strategic alliance, we are going to do a uh, 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 the two, two countries agreed on reinforcing the two bilateral partnership. First of all, I'm going to talk about supply chain policies between the two countries. As uh, Mr. Baccaro just mentioned, the United States 
has issued a lot of policies for supply chain. Uh, what's uh, in particular, the United States, not only uh, internal development, but also it is stressing ally shoring, for example, uh, like cooperation with allies and partnerships. Next is Korea's uh, supply chain strategy. Uh, Korea's uh, supply chain policy is mostly focusing on cooperation with the United States. First of all, in the procurement area, uh, we are reviewing entry into SOSA. And secondly, in the cybersecurity area, we are uh, based on the CMMC of the United States. Uh, we are preparing KCMMC. And also in the advanced technology area, we are trying to participate in FCT and also uh, have cooperation with the United States in military semiconductor and space. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the status of Korea in terms of SOSA that we are reviewing right now. SOSA, uh, the, this arrangement, as you can see from its name, it is a part of the efforts to have security alliance and also so, uh, supply chain cooperation. It is mostly about guaranteeing the mutual supply of goods. It's not legally binding, but it is going to be very effective. It is going to be uh, signed between the United States, uh, DOD, and DAPA. And currently, uh, the United States have SOSA with 12 countries. So these are the key contents of SOSA. So it is about having a priority on some certain contracts. Then the counterparts will support the other country so that you can have implementation of priorities. Through SOSA, the two countries can have time, uh, can ask for uh, timely delivery and get support on that. Uh, the United States had DPAS, which is the existing system, and Korea does not have such a uh, system currently. So currently, also uh, the DAPA and uh, the promotion agency can have COC to support priority. And the industries of Korea can voluntarily participate in this arrangement. Uh, through SOSA signing, we think that our partnership will be reinforced. And also, the companies that participate in this arrangement will be recognized as a trustworthy suppliers. So it will be a good opportunity for them to also participate in the global supply chain. Next, Rock U.S. Corporation in Cybersecurity. Currently, the United States targeting 2026 is implementing cybersecurity certification system, which is CMMC. The United States, not only the prime companies participating in the acquisition project, but also international uh, companies also required are required to have CMMC. Uh, it has five grades, and it's going to be revised this year, CMMC 2.0. Based on this, for uh, Korean defense industrial companies that are participating in some ac many acquisition projects of the United States, CMMC is a, is a must. As a representative case, like F-35 and F-A-50, CMMC is very important uh, to have contract with DOD. Fortunately, the Republic of Korea has made a lot of investment in defense industry technologies. Under the name of Integrated Survey, in the name of Integrated Assessment, actually, it, it has evaluated 1,226 items in six areas every year. 
this integrated assessment not only uh, is about information protection, but also technology management and military confidentiality. Based on this assessment, Korea will also trying to include uh, items from CMMC to establish so-called KCMMC. More specifically, in 2026, before the all-out implementation of CMMC, we are trying to establish KCMMC to have mutual recognition with the United States. <coughs> Uh, the U.S. DOD also announced that it will uh, pursue mutual recognition with CMMC with a uh, foreign cyber security system. So we can uh, look forward to mutual recognition of KCMC and CMMC of the United States. Through that, uh, internally in Korea, like domestic companies can have more credibility and also it will open more opportunities to uh, participate as contractor to acquisition project of the United States. Ultimately, among allies, we'll be able to minimize overlapped investment so that we can secure more time and resources. Next is Rock U.S. Corporation in Military Semiconductors. Korea is a world-renowned semiconductor powerhouse, but we are still lagging behind in terms of DM mem memory, which is important for the military industry. Due to the recent crisis, there is this unit price increase and crisis in terms of the supply of semiconductor. DAPA, in the second of this year, we will establish a development strategy of military semiconductor, and it will pursue plans to secure technologies and nurture industry for weapon system. Uh, from 2023 to 2027, we will identify important and major semiconductors, and we're trying to secure relevant technologies. And from 2018 until 2032, we will pursue onshoring for critical military semiconductors. And from 2033 to 2037, we will try to have self-reliance of semiconductor in the military area, and we are trying to have also the IP to ad uh, secure advanced technologies. And for such development plan of Korea's military uh, semiconductors, it is essential to have cooperation with the United States in terms of technology, infrastructure, and investment. The United States is number one in the world, so if Korea will, for Korea, it is very important to have a benchmarking of the United States, but more than that, what's really important is the capabilities of the United States and also Korea's uh, strength in the memory uh, semiconductor. Through that, we'll be able to have a win-win st strategy, and we're trying to propose that. If we can share technology development roadmap, and if we can together do a joint R&D in this regard, I think we can have better results. Like I just mentioned, uh, to implement such policies, there are roles for each of the stakeholders. First of all, the government. Uh, the two governments already have a lot of devices for implementation of such policies, DTICC, DICSC, TCSC. There are many uh, entities to implement such policies. In 2023, the like SOSA, CMMC, and other uh, military semiconductor related corporations policies can be discussed. And we we look forward to see that we see agreements in this regard. Next is industry and 
academia, including the civil uh, think tanks like CSIS. Well, companies of the two countries already have strong partnership. However, I hope this can be an opportunity for us to accelerate such partnership. And also, so, like CSIS, uh, the like civil think tank is very important. This third generation partnership was the agenda proposed by CSIS, and this is now reflected in the two countries' major policies having actual impact as we see. Like I mentioned, like SOSA, CMMC, and like Military Semiconductor Corporation, we have made a lot of progress in terms of like our discussion with DOD, some of them are just at the stage of idea sharing. But what's for sure is that the two countries based on our alliance, is are, we are going forward to make a trustworthy supply chain. The current uh, global security environment really emphasizes the need for our alliances. Under this environment, Korea will do our best to become a trustworthy supplier. Thank you. Mr. Yun, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, and you've given us a great deal to think about as we uh, launch into this second panel. Thank you very much. Please join me in a round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Baccaro. I'd like to use Mr. Yun's slides. It'd be perfect for me because we could do the discussion. Um, no, I'm, you know, I'm happy you went first because that's really going to um, help me um, sort of frame some comments. But um, I'm also happy that someone read our report from last February because I recognized the four eyes. So I was very happy to see that. But um, you know, I, I think a lot of what you heard me speak earlier um, is relevant to today's discussion or this panel's discussion. But uh, let me just kind of maybe zero in on um, a couple of key points that Mr. Yoon raised and maybe elaborate a little bit more on what we're thinking. Um, one is on the uh, security supply arrangement. And um, I think during the coffee break, I had an opportunity to chat with several people here. And I think I made it highlighted that I've been championing of having a SOSA um, with Korea probably for about 15 years. And so I'm really excited um, that we're um, getting very close um, to finalizing one. Um, so, you know, if you look at the, the idea of a SOSA, um, the United States is, has had a longstanding security supply arrangement with Canada, which actually dates back to 1950. And it just makes sense given the integrated nature of our defense industrial bases. The other SOSAs really started to appear in uh, the early 2000s. And, um, and so actually we have 14 of them right now because we just signed one with Israel two weeks ago. Um, and, um, and I think it was just really evident that um, in the early 2000s, as there was consolidation in our defense industrial base um, and in Europe, you know, we felt it was necessary to have mechanisms in place that, um, that indicated partly to prevent Fortress Europe from happening. We didn't want Europe to feel like they should just rely on European suppliers. Um, but we also recognize that um, we're big governments. And in the event of a, an emergency or you experience a supply chain disruption, it could actually take a while to find the right people who could potentially help. And that's one of the benefits of having a SOSA. You have designated points of contact. Um, so I'll tell you the experience. Um, we had a flurry of arrangements that we negotiated in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, um, um, largely with Western Euro European countries. Um, then there was a pause, and then you'll see a surge of additional ones. And a lot of those were related to countries recognizing the interdependences of our supply chains in the context of Iraq and Afghanistan. And there was a lot of countries who were relying upon US suppliers and were having difficulty getting spare parts for their systems, especially if they were US origin. And that's why you saw the flurry of activity. And then there was sort of a pause. Um, we hadn't done one. Uh, Norway was the last one we had done up until recently. And I think that was in 2018. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, um, as part of our supply chain report, 
we really highlighted that we felt that SOSAs were being, we needed to have more. And so we've had a, separate, a second wave, if you will. And, um, and Korea is part of that second wave. Um, and I'm really hopeful that we can uh, conclude an arrangement with Korea soon and hopefully in coming months um, and additional partners. We're talking to several other countries right now. But I, again, I, it's just an important mechanism. And I tell stories, so I'll, I'll tell a story. Um, um, I was visiting um, with a Western European country, um, and this was when operations in Iraq were pretty hot. And this is with a partner that we already had an existing security supply arrangement with. And it's the night before we're having our full bilat meeting, we're having a dinner, and I'm sitting across my procurement counterpart. And I ask him, are you having any specific challenges in your procurements? And he says, oh, yes, we are. I'm trying to get spare parts for this US origin aircraft. Um, we got aircraft on the ground. We're supporting you downrange. And th I've been trying to solve this problem for three months. And he's telling the story. And it's, oh, and it's going to be raised at the four-star level. There's going to be a call. And I'm like, aren't you my security supply counterpart? And he said, yes, but I'm new in the position. What is that all about? And so this poor guy had been trying to solve this problem on his own uh, for, for months. And once he had discussed the challenge with me, we were able to solve the problem and get the items delivered to what they needed in less than two or three weeks. So it's an example. Not only is it important to have these mechanisms, but to actually have that personal contact and have people understand what the benefit is. Um, so I, I think another huge benefit of having this SOSA, and it builds on the theme we talked about earlier, how do you can help um, encourage industry to industry cooperation among our industry, is as Mr. Yoon highlighted, it's, it signals that Korea and their companies who signed the code of conduct want to be reliable suppliers to us. And so, um, you know, and what we'll do, um, and I look forward to having opportunities to engage with KDIA, who I've met, uh, supported meetings in the past, but let's leverage those, our trade associations, and KDI in particular, you know, to highlight what capabilities Korean industry may want to highlight to help satisfy U.S. requirements or to help support um, the U.S. supply chain writ large. And so it's also an opportunity not only to have designated points of contact to respond to urgent requirements as necessary, but it's also an ability for a Korean industry to highlight um, another form for them to highlight their capabilities. So I, I think that's a, it's going to be a really good. I should also say that you know, even without a security supply arrangement, if the Korean government or Korean industry is experiencing challenges today in getting timely delivery of um, equipment from the U.S. suppliers, we do have mechanisms today, and we are actually working on a couple of examples now, where we can actually authorize Korea uh, and your industry to use our DPAS system, which gives priority. But having a SOSA just makes it much easier and quicker from an approval process for our side. But, um, but if there are challenges today that are emerging that you need assistance with, don't wait for the security supply arrangement. We can help address them now. And there's folks in DAPA who know how to do this in the embassy, our embassy team. Um, on, the, on the second topic, on the third topic, I guess, on, on CMMC, this kind of builds upon, you know, the key enablers that we talked about earlier that from a cyberspace, you, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And um, CMMC was an initiative started in the last administration. Um, and, you know, they, they recognized that, you know, we needed to do more in cyber. Um, and this administration, the, the Biden-Harris administration, has also recognized that. Um, but there was um, a lot of industry um, concerns or uh, that was highlighted um, about CMMC 1.0. Um, and so when the new administration took office, um, they directed a review of the CMMC approach. Um, and um, there was a recommendations and findings shared with Deputy Hicks. Um, and that's when the decision was made to um, pursue what we're referring to as CMMC 2.0. Um, and ANS had been the lead for CMMC 1.0. Um, Dr. Hicks made the determination decision, and 
makes a lot of sense to actually move that responsibility to our office of the chief information officer. So right now, I, my team is not involved in the development of CMMC uh, 2.0. It is um, the responsibility of our chief information officer, and I know they are in the process of um, drafting a rule. What I will say is it's my understanding um, that this rule will be published as a proposed rule. Um, and what that means is that when we publish the rule, it will be published for comment by um, industry and the public writ large. And it will be published in our, office, uh, by our, in our federal register, which comes out every day. Um, I will encourage industry, both U.S. and international, that when that rule is published, is proposed format, to review it closely and if there are things that work well, highlight that in comments. We welcome comments. Um, but if there are areas of concern, um, I would encourage you to acknowledge those and submit comments on those. I will say I, I mentioned earlier um, in my remarks that I was heavily involved in export control reform um, in um, the Obama administration. And that was you know, a multi-year effort to transfer less sensitive military items uh, from state control to commerce control. And what we have found to be critical to the success of that initiative was that we published proposed rules for every category that we were trying to transfer to make sure that what we were proposing made sense to the regulated community. And then in that case, it was industry. And it was US industry and foreign industry. And I will say that the comments under our, our rulemaking process, we have to seriously evaluate and address any comment we receive from the public as we develop our final rule. So we cannot just ignore a comment. And I'll tell you that that rulemaking process helped ensure, I think, that when we did go final for the various categories, export control reform, that we developed a new system that was capturing what we wanted to capture and could be enforced and, and complied with by industry. And I will say that in a couple of categories, the comments we received from industry were so enlightening that we went back and had to publish another proposed rule before we went final. So again, just to stress that sometimes the, you, 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 industry has an opportunity to be part of this process so I encourage you, once it is published, to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, we're, we, we talked a lot about semiconductors. Um, and obviously, Korea plays a, a leading role in semiconductors. And um, some of you, the Korean semiconductor um, leading manufacturers, have, have met with our senior department leadership in, in the recent months. Um, I will say that's a great example of um, a sector where um, the Department of Defense is not the leaders, right? We account for probably 2% of uh, microelectronics consumption in the United States. But what we need is really important to our weapon systems, right? And um, you know, one of the things I, you know, I don't think people appreciated so much last year, uh, and it started really with Javelin and Stingers, but folks didn't understand why we couldn't just start producing you know, vast amounts of these weapons within weeks. And you know, on good days, let's use Javelin as an example. You know, in good days, it probably takes 18 to 24 months to make one a Javelin system. Um, but these are complicated machines. These are not, you know, folks have a tendency to think of the movies during re reporting on World War II, where we were pushing, you know, shells by the, you know, hundreds of thousands through assembly lines. The arsenal of democracy, you know. It's, um, but you know, these are highly complex machines. And they have hundreds, if not you know, thousands, of semiconductor or microelectronic components in them. And so that, that's critical. And so the challenge that we really have as a Department of Defense is, yes, we need the state-of-the-art future semiconductors. But we also need reliable suppliers of legacy chips because our systems are going to be at our inventory for a long, long time. And you want to make sure we have that capability. So that's sort of as we're working together as a whole of government approach um, with our commerce colleagues and energy and other colleagues as part of the CHIPS Act, 
that we want to make sure that we're considering the important national security implications and requirements that we have um, going forward. Um, our, I know that I think during one of your last conferences, um, our uh, Dave Honey from our research and engineering participated, and, and Dave, he, Dave is one of the leaders in the department on working the microelectronics uh, challenges. The other leader uh, from ANS is actually Dr. Chris McKenzie, who's going to participate in the panel this afternoon. So um, she's really been our point person um, for implementing the CHIPS Act. So I'm sure you'll have a lively discussion with her uh, this afternoon on that. But again, I think going back to our fundamental strategy on um, the supply chain and microelectronics, international is key, working together with our allies and partners, government and industry. And so um, I'm happy you, you raised that as an area. Um, you also highlighted. Uh, 그리고 또 강조해 주셨던 것이 이 다양한 기존의 체계들을 다시 재활성화에 대한 것인데. Uh, the DTIC, which unfortunately really hasn't met. I think the last time there was a face-to-face -face meeting was in 2018. Um, I've been with the department to 2019, and unfortunately, I, I arrived. And then about a few months later, or a year later, we had COVID, and we weren't able to have, um, squeeze in the DTIC before that occurred. But uh, I will stress that, you know, I think that Dr. LaPlante highlighted it during our meeting with the minister on Tuesday, but we look forward to hosting this meeting um, in the coming months in Washington. We look forward to it. And my understanding is our teams had a good discussion yesterday and are building a robust discussion that will sort of highlight a lot of what we're trying to, areas where we want to cooperate in the uh, going forward, but also from the supply chain standpoint, um, you know, sharing lessons learned. We've learned a lot uh, based on the experience in the past year with Ukraine, and we look forward to sharing um, lessons learned uh, with Korea uh, and other countries around the world and with NATO. So, and also I think that, you know, I'm happy that R&E was able to have their TSC meeting in the fall, and the readout I got from that, that it, it was good, and they were sort of revitalizing uh, that work stream, which is critical too. Um, so I, th I think if you're looking at it from a, like a, we, where we have the DTIC, where we have the robust discussion on defense industrial-based cooperation, but we're also revitalizing the government-to-government, -government, both S&T type cooperation, but hopefully that will lead to broader um, co-production, co-development, um, and other cooperation in that space. Uh, but again, I also want to highlight that I think we should also, we can leverage the industry to industry uh, forums um, and look forward to receiving input and academia for suggestions and where we should, what are win-win opportunities. But, uh, but I, I'm very optimistic that, you know, that we're set to have great success this year, both at the government to government side, but also at the industry to industry side. And, I, I'm, and also in the FCC program, I'm really happy that you highlighted that. Um, my understanding is I think there are five active FCT programs, foreign comparative test programs involving Korean industry today. And actually, one of the Korean industry reps uh, came up to me today. He was actively, he was one of the projects that are active. So again, that's a great example of us leveraging both of our industrial bases. So look forward to the rest of the discussion on the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was, yes, please join me in a second round of applause. I think. What we have before us is already a very rich set of issues building off of the, the first discussion and now these two presentations. But I, before we start diving into those questions, I think we have even more to put on the table. And to help us do that, we have four superb panelists who I'll introduce very briefly, and then we'll go, I think, Korea, US, Korea, US through the panels. So uh, quick introductions. Uh, American to my right, uh, Mr. Carlton Johnson, Colonel, United States Air Force, retired is the chairman of the National Space Society. Uh, and in that role, he's the chairman of the society's board of governors, and he provides strategic and senior executive leadership to the board of governors in support of the society's goals, and serves as a primary spokesman for the Space Society's board of governors. Uh, in 2014, he retired from active duty in the Air Force after 26 years, um, where he held a variety of senior uh, leadership and command positions within the US Air Force. Uh, I look forward to hearing your comments, uh, Mr. Johnson. And to my, le well, let's go Americans and then Koreans and then we'll go around. So Pat Mazin is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Defense Exports and Cooperation. He is the Army Principal 
responsible for security assistance and armaments cooperation. I've been out of government too long. These words are not, no longer flowing off the tongue correctly. Um, he also manages export policies, uh, direct commercial sales of U.S. Army defense articles, and international cooperation, research, development, and acquisition. He has held numerous roles, uh, of senior roles, managing and overseeing programs within the military, or within the Army, particularly on the aviation and missiles side of the house. Um, for our Korean colleagues, we have Mr. Cho Jun Hyun, Director for Defense Acquisition and Innovation uh, in DAPA. He has previously served as the Director of Finance and Director of Defense Industries Job Division. And uh, like Mr. Yoon, he was a visiting fellow here at CSIS. So I'm noticing a trend line. Thank you and welcome back. Um, and finally, but not least, uh, Mr. Han Sung Jae, who is the Director of Global Defense Business Division at the Korean Research Institute for Defense Technology Planning and Advancement. Uh, there he has held, num well, over his career, he has held numerous positions of responsibility in the Korean Army, in the Korean government, and in Korean industry. So providing a, a well-rounded perspective that uh, we look forward to hearing from. Uh, in the military, he was an Army officer. He served in defense industry in a, several advisory roles to Korean uh, corporations. Uh, and has worked international cooperation within the South Korean Ministry of National Defense. So if I could, uh, I'll start, uh, Pat, with you, um, and then we'll go next to, to Mr. Cho. All right. Well, well, good morning. Almost, I think it's good afternoon now. So good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to CSIS for, uh, for having an Army representative. And uh, hopefully I can provide a little context uh, in just a few brief remarks on how you move from policy down to implementation and how at the service level we are implementing the things that Mike has talked about and how that has played out uh, really over the last, I will say, 18 months in some of the critical actions we've had to take, but really how that goes forward to what we've discussed earlier today. And, and Minister, you talked about this third generation approach to our cooperation. So if I take a step back, I know um, in the introduction talked about what we do, but it is unique because we span between our ANS colleagues that are at OSD, the R&E colleagues at OSD, as well as uh, Director Hirsch and the, and the, uh, the Director of Security Cooperation. Um, and so in doing that, it's really the Security Assistance FMS, it's Armaments Cooperation and Collaborative Science and Technology, it's Foreign Comparative Test, it's Tech Security and Foreign Disclosure, it's the licensing an export piece in conjunction with our colleagues, and then it's also the technical exchanges. In fact, we have three technical exchanges right now uh, between Korea and the United States in the area of medical and then uh, really artificial intelligence. Um, and, and that's a program that we orchestrate on behalf of our, our science and technology community. So when you look at that, I wanted to make some comments just on how we are moving forward in a number of different areas and Obviously, the backdrop of that is the tremendous challenges that we're having in supplying what is necessary and the realization of the issues within the defense industrial base where we don't have the resiliency and the responsiveness. And certainly Mike's example, Stinger and Javelin, usually Army examples are brought out because of the amount of material uh, that has been provided to Ukraine. Uh, but then also, as we've looked at global demand, land forces have seen a renewed interest in quite honestly things that had gone, I'll say, out of vogue, armor formations, artillery, rockets, and then your munitions depth. Those land forces elements, we had leaned down, and I will say that I was part of that process as a former program executive officer. What I was looking for was very lean multi-year contracts on our aircraft, lean supply chains, and price points so that we could buy at quantity in many cases and what you sacrificed on that was the robustness of the industrial base, multiple suppliers, and then the ability to have a resilient supply chain that gave you the opportunity when you had disruptions to quickly recover or it really gave you the surge capability that is necessary. And so certainly working for the Honorable Doug Bush, who's the Army Acquisition Executive, he is, is my boss and we are underneath ASALT. Uh, this is a focus area of his and it's really a focus area not just for the United States Army so that we can equip the Army, but also for all of our international partners because it is clear, and as we've seen play out in Ukraine and in the security environment, that it is 
by, with, and through allies and partners that we execute all of our operations in the future. And so you've really seen a very, very large shift within the Department of the Army over the last, I would say, 24 to 36 months. Um, and uh, I consequently get a lot of help from everybody these days uh, as we look at our relationships with allies and partners. And so with that as a little bit of a backdrop, I also want to put the challenge forward of what we're doing in the Army from a modernization perspective. And so as the Army is doing this, and we have to look at resilient supply chains for the systems that exist today, the Army is executing a massive modernization effort. Uh, whether it is next generation combat vehicles, long range, precision, long range precision fires, integrated air and missile defense, or future vertical lift, as we modernize to those systems, we are taking the lessons that we've had in the past and looking for how those can go from collaborative science and technology work into collaborative development, collaborative production, and then how we manage supply chains collaboratively as well as do sustainment activities collaboratively. And, and I will say CSIS has played a critical role in that as we looked at things that improve for exportability such as open systems architecture and how we integrate that into our combat vehicles, aircraft, and artillery systems because the research that was done on that and how we change the business model associated with that is critical to ensure that we have exportability in the designs as they evolve and then also really what that plays out to is interoperability because that is what we are ultimately interested in so that when we have multilateral operations that we have interoperable forces that can execute, should they be called to fight, can execute a fight or in defense, deter forces because of the interoperability that we collectively provide within an integrated security environment. And so from a tangible perspective on the armaments cooperation front, while we haven't had those meetings since 2018, uh, we do have a number of science and technology efforts that are going on right now. In fact, seven total, which doesn't sound like a lot, but these are robust science and technology collaborative work, not just data exchanges, and we have two more in development. And certainly, the, I'm going to say the hope out of this, but the methodology that we're looking at is not that we simply collaborate on science and technology and then we go in separate directions. Rather, it's how does that lead to co-development of systems or subcomponents, elements, that could go into systems that, again, ensure that interoperability, and then how that leads into production opportunities throughout um, our allies and partners where that is shared, and we certainly see the need for that. And then the last aspect of that that I talked about earlier is how that leads into the sustainment side of the house. And so with that, from that s and working group that we have, we're also underneath the, T the, the DTIC and the TCSC and all of our nice acronyms that we have, we are also starting a logistics working group because we feel very strongly that we have to have a strong logistics component and look at how we do repair and returnables for both the ROC and for U.S. forces, as well as regionally within the Indo-PACOM region. That's critically important, and so that's really the next step that we're taking. Um, the, the last comment, and I, I know I think we're given maybe five minutes, so there's a number of different areas I can talk about, but I did want to talk just on supply chain because the one thing that we did realize, and certainly OSD, the policies that they sent down, is we really did not understand the depth of our supply chain. And it started in COVID, and I was a PEO at the time. And so what I realized from that is because of the nature of our supply chains and the disruptions that we had due to the pandemic, we really need to have illumination on it. There's certainly a number of tools. There is an industry component to that. There's a government component to that, and it requires significant collaboration. And so that is the area that we have worked extensively on. And again, I'll highlight work by CSIS because of the aviation side where it looked at the aviation industrial base and it looked where it collapsed down into fragile suppliers where we needed to go and do targeted investment. And so that is the opportunity with allies and partners as we work forward and we really explore our supply chains to understand where those fragile suppliers are, how we reinforce that by having opportunities for greater growth for businesses to participate in that, and then how we can have that secured source of supply. And so that's a tangible example of how we went down and identified the areas that we specifically wanted to target with industry, and then really looking at industry to take that lead and figure out how to diversify or build that supply base. 
And then the last thing that I will say on CMMC and the cybersecurity aspects is it, it is a balancing act as we go out there because we want to entice small businesses. One of the areas that Mike had talked about earlier is the fact that we have a number of small businesses that are not participatory anymore. And I will say that on the Army side, within the Small Business Innovative Research, we've actually standardized and streamlined the contracting process so that they have to learn at once. It doesn't have a lot of overhead because these are very, very small businesses. And so how we do that, because we have to have cybersecurity built into our supply chains, we know that. And that's why it's going out for public comment. And so that's an area that we are also working on within the Army on how we actually implement that with industry and also ensure that small businesses can be participatory in that. And that is a, a, that's a tough road to navigate. And that, to me, is one of the bigger challenges ahead. So thanks very much. Pat, thank you very much. That was outstanding. And I would just like to say, on behalf of my colleagues, Cynthia Cook and, and Greg Sanders, who led much of the work that you referenced, um, it's always good to hear that the work is, is reaching people who are listening. So thank you. Uh, let me turn now to Mr. Mr. Cho Jun Kuhn for, for your comments. Yes, good morning. I was at, I was a visiting scholar here in 2019, and that was a great experience for me personally. Currently, I am the, the Global Defense Business Division Director. In fact, uh, for the case of Korea, we have Samsung, SK Hynix, and other memory-related big uh, players. And they have great technology, and they have global competitiveness. However, for those memories that can be applied to the weapon system, those are all non-memory chips, mostly. And the system uh, semiconductors are generally used for the weapon system. But this area, Korea doesn't quite have technology or competitiveness in the sector yet. For these uh, semiconductors for the weapon system, they have to be operated under extreme uh, conditions and have to have high reliability. And for the 20 to 30 years of the weapon system life cycle, the semiconductor has to be supplied to the weapon system to be viable option. And uh, Assistant Secretary Vicaro just said, profitability of these items are generally low because the quantity is very low. So it's hard to have a scope of economy economy and scope for this matter. And what also matters is the security and maintenance of security. So how to deal with the security is what we need to think about. And for the system, semiconductors, interfaces, and other software-related uh, connectivity and interoperabilities are all very important factors. So we have various uh, obstacles to uh, overcome. When we uh, deep dive into the uh, semiconductor sector, unlike the other items, the production process is very complicated and production is very divided. For instance, fabless and uh, post-fabless design and IP foundries, packing, all of these are one of the processes and very complicated and divided. So one company cannot handle the entire process, which is a special characteristic of the item and industry. That is important factor, but uh, for us, AI, which can be connectivity to the unmanned systems and et cetera, all these developments when they're developed together, the system semiconductor can also develop alongside with it. Otherwise, it'll be unbalanced, which will be a problem for us. And so we uh, are at the beginning stage of the policy for these items, but by the end of this year, the ROC government 
is trying to have a uh, bird's eye view of our strategy and policy on this. And we need cooperation with the U.S. in this sector. It's critical. For the case of the United States, uh, Assistant Secretary mentioned in his remarks, uh, the market share of the DOD in that sector is 2%, and the quantity is quite low. Because of the low quantity, it's hard to have a, a proper production and proper supply chain. And that's what I can easily predict, because that's what we're thinking in Korea as well. That's why we need cooperation between the two countries, and especially in the R&D sector. So uh, through the joint R&D, we can uh, jointly develop uh, a chip. So if we have a joint standards and work on it, that can uh, drive down the cost a lot. And we can uh, have a very cost-effective cost mass production and overall productivity and production efficiency later on. To some degree, when we're establishing strategies and roadmaps, I think we need to share our roadmaps and strategies so that we can have a good direction for the two governments to go forward. Lastly, overall, the tanks and aircrafts and all these final items, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the lowest uh, tier uh, items. With that, we need cooperation between the traditional defense businesses, but we also need cooperation uh, between the defense industries and semiconductor specialty companies in case of Korea. So we need to have a variety of channels of cooperation. We have to reorganize that cooperation system. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a, a great dive into the, the specific challenges we face in, in the cyber realm. So thank you very much, Mr. Cho. Carlton, please, over to you. I'm, I'm probably going to mess up the translator, so I, I apologize for this. Johnson Teddy on the Colonel Johnson Teddy, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I love Korea. Let's go together. My brothers and sisters out there from Korea, uh, I do love the Korean people. My, my father fought in the Korean War. Uh, my uh, youngest son was adopted in Korea. And I had the opportunity to serve with some great leaders, some of them who are here today. And one of the things that I got to understand while serving in Korea was the threat that you have to deal with from the North is a lot different than what other nations, I believe, have to deal with. For example, when we talk about things like cybersecurity and cyber risk in the United States, and when we have a cyber attack on something like our pipeline, you know, very significant, causes problems, but the adversary is not seen. The effects of the adversary are seen. However, when you have a cyber attack in Korea that happens to come from, say, North Korea, you have 35 kilometers or so between you and potentially in the next war. So while serving in Korea, I had the opportunity, uh, and I'll say I was given the opportunity by a gentleman uh, called uh, uh, General uh, Thurman. If you ever seen General Thurman, uh, he's a very uh, intimidating person. And during our first session, uh, he was getting an update on an exercise we were going to do. And he asked specifically, what are we going to do about the cyber threat? And there was silence at that moment. And he looked around and he said, where's my J6? And I was the joint, the J6, so I pressed the button and I said, uh, uh, sir, uh, Colonel Carlton Johnson, J6 at, at your six o'clock. General Thurman turned around and looked at me. And this big gentleman got up and said, you're not an army guy. And I went, no, sir, I'm better than that. And he said, you know, you don't want to end up on the hood of my car, right? I said, sir, I won't be that guy. You're going to have great cybersecurity. And right after that, I got with the J3 and the J2, the Intel and Ops, and said, gentlemen, I, I, I think we need to build a cyber capability like really quickly, because that's not going to be me on his hood. 
And through that effort, we were able to create the first joint cyber center that was the only uh, cyber center that was a sub-unified command uh, joint cyber center. And I had the opportunity to hand deliver the first uh, cyber intelligence to my ROC counterpart, the uh, ROC uh, cyber commander. Uh, he and I were on speed dial. So I got to very uh, upfront understand the cyber threat. And because of that, when I transitioned out of the military and had gone into the uh, public sector, I, in addition to serving as the chairman of the National Space Society, uh, I have a practice that does cyber uh, space development and also C-suite advisory and AI uh, ethics uh, development. Uh, we also, I had the opportunity to become part of the CMMC effort. The thing I'll say about CMMC, and we'll talk about that a little bit more is, imagine this, a, a situation where we know that the supply chain is at risk, but you wanna have industry be part of that solution. You call industry together and you say, help me solve the problem. A group of seven people get together. That seven people are asked to create a company, and that company has to be a nonprofit to work this problem. Zero funding, repeat, zero funding, but you have to support 375,000 companies in the defense industrial base. So we went from zero to hero in a COVID environment. That's a remarkable uh, accomplishment. And I want to applaud the men and women who stepped up to do that. And Matt Travis, who's now the CEO of the now Cyber AB, is leading that effort. But here's the challenge when it comes to something like CMMC. CMMC, regardless of if you're using something like zero trust or whatever discipline, it comes down to understanding and accepting risk. And part of the challenge with small to medium-sized businesses is that they've had to carry this risk a long time, but they chose not to accept that fact. And that's why under the what they call the NIST 800-171 criteria, which if you have a government contract you're supposed to do anyway, people were not doing it. So CMMC is really a lever to encourage and emphasize and validate whether or not you're doing what you're supposed to do. In Korea, you have an opportunity to do a CMMC-like environment. You may not do it exactly like the United States does, and that's up to you. There's a lot of opportunity to evolve it in a way that works for you. But you have more of a prerogative to do it because of the threat and how pervasive it is for you. So I would recommend that as we're talking about this, uh, you look at not only implementing it, but implementing it in a way that works for you and leveraging on the successes and the challenges that we've seen in the United States. Uh, the last thing I'll say about that is as we talk about, uh, again, small business and large business. Again, it's not a uh, matter of if, it's a matter of when you're going to get cyber attacked. And here's something that keeps me up at night. It's not an attack on my national infrastructure. I, I feel that we have great men and women uh, serving in uh, powers, uh, excuse me, levels of power and authority to oversight and make sure that that doesn't happen. What concerns me is a small business who doesn't look at protecting their own IP as well as they would protect anything else. A single part that comes in and is now configured differently a spec is changed. That spec goes into a weapon system that's supposed to defend the men and women that are, are defending the nation. And then I see that as men and women dying unnecessarily. And that's something that doesn't happen on my watch. And I hope it doesn't happen on yours. So my encouragement is that you take this opportunity to uh, work with the United States as much as possible on strengthening your cyber hygiene and leveraging uh, capabilities like CMMC and Zero Trust and others to do, do that. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll pass it over, on the space side, I'm putting on my National Space Society hat. Uh, in addition to cyber, space is cool once again, and I wanna thank guys like Elon Musk and, and others, but all they're focusing on right now is launch. That's, that's good, that gives us access. 
We need to look at the entire ecosystem of what we're going to do in space. And countries that are both spacefaring, like the United States, and countries that are non-spacefaring or emerging spacefaring nations have an opportunity to figure out how we're going to work together. Something I'll leave with you as a vignette. Let's say that this is an asteroid, and your company, one of your companies, sir, goes out, lands on an asteroid, and now they find uranium or uh, iridium. Uh, another country, I'm not going to say China, comes in and lands on the other side of the asteroid. Who owns the asteroid? You or China? Well, I would submit that whoever has a bigger gun is going to own it. So we have to have a conversation of what are we, or how are we going to operate in space? What are we going to do in space? What are the potential areas of collaboration? And this is another area that we as United States and Korea have an opportunity to talk about how we're going to kapshi kapshi da. 그래서 우리가 그냥 지구를 벗어나서도 이런 같이 가시다라는 정신을 계속해서 계속해야 돼. We We are running very close on time. So before I turn to our last panelist Mr. Han, I will say if we have time for one or two questions to prepare them now so we don't have a moment of awkward silence and run, run dry on time. But Mr. Han, the floor is yours. Thank you. 네, 안녕하십니까. 저는 빵 기술 지능 연구소 그래서 방산 수출 사업부장. I am from Korea Research Institute for Defense Technology Planning and Advancement Global Defense Business Division 한승재 I was also I has also have also participated in this conference from 2019 not as a visiting scholar but as a participant like our director general mentioned that all this like reliable supply chain TVC global economy security I think these can be very important issues especially with the covid pandemic and Ukraine more we have realized the need for trustworthy supply chain partner. Uh, the word trust or credibility, I think, have two kinds of meaning to TVC participants. First of all, it is about uh, pursuing common value among the United States and also like friendly countries at the level of diplomacy and security. Uh, the second meaning would be about deliver delivery, quality compliance, in I mean, in terms of the economic uh, meaning of trust for the pr products. Uh, to have robust TVC, I think it's very important to broaden the horizon of cooperation in the industry between the two countries. In this regard, I think I, I want to talk about TVC cybersecurity and also military semiconductor on in regard to the cooperation plan between the two countries. First of all, about the trustworthy supply chain. Uh, TVC. So I think the companies that can contribute to bilateral uh, supply chain cooperation, I think they need to pursue continuously establishment of database on technology and products. KRIT is leading the efforts to, for projects on key technology development and part development to nurture our industries, companies with competitiveness and innovativeness. Uh, we have established and managed uh, database on these companies domestically. And moreover, uh, DAPA, which is leading the system development project, we are trying to have mutual exchanges of database on the companies that we have uh, data about. I think such efforts will be uh, helpful in having continuous and immediate cooperation by utilizing such database by identifying fragile supply chain area. And secondly, as Assistant Secretary just mentioned, FCT and also FTAS uh, project by the U.S. Army Center as the participants to such cooperation project, we are very committed to participate in those projects. Uh, last February in Seoul, 
Uh, for 27 Korean companies, the US FCT team visited Korea and had one on one consultation meetings. There were a lot of progresses in this event. And through such uh, events, uh, promising companies in Korea are participating actively in FCT efforts. So I'm hoping that FCT project is not going to become just a testing uh, vehicle. I hope it will become a successful model that will lead to actual acquisition project. And moreover, similarly, if there are projects uh, that the U.S. Army, want, U.S. military wants from the allies, we will actively cooperate with you. Thirdly, based on reinforced uh, supply chain cooperation, I think we need to have co-development of weapon system and also co-export and marketing, which is actually so-called the third generation partnership. The two countries do have a great case, which is T-50 trainer jet, which is gaining a lot of attention globally. As you know, the T-50 trainer jet, was de which was developed as part of on the sideline of F-16, is being very successful, being exported to Southeast Asia and Middle East. And we are, are sharing this uh, successful security results and economic results together with the United States. Going beyond this, I think that the two countries also our allies, in order to respond to closely to our common threat, we need to have co-research development program for weapon system and also to for export to uh, third countries. Next is cooperation plans in the cybersecurity area. There is a lot of cases of technology extortion in cyber space. So I think it's very meaningful to have a safety net such as CMMC. Currently, the United States is implementing CMMC cyber security certification system targeting 2026 uh, for full implementation. That, uh, it, this is necessary not only for the direct contractor participating in the acquisition project of the United States, but also for the subcontractors under them. Uh, like the international in cooperation, Director General just explained our KRIT together with establishment of KCMMC. We are uh, conducting specialized training for uh, Korean defense industry companies so that they can be prepared for CMMC in advance. So that in 2016, when it's fully implemented, we will support our companies so that they can actively participate in the U.S. supply chain. Ultimately, I believe that uh, to build a reliable TVC between the two countries, we need uh, mutual recognition between the US CMMC and Korea's KCMMC. KRIT uh, will support DAPA so that we can have smooth implementation of mutual recognition between KCMMC and US CMMC. Lastly, I will talk about the plans to for bilateral defense industry cooperation in military semiconductor. KRRT is planning and implementing R&D projects on military semiconductor, including part development uh, project, and will gradually expand R&D initiatives in semiconductor area based on our related policies. And also the KRIT has this project called Defense Industry Innovation Business 100, supporting five major areas, which includes semiconductor. And the United States, of course, is a traditional powerhouse in system uh, semiconductor design or engineering, and Korea is very strong in memory semiconductor, and it's also a manufacturer. I think cooperation with the two of the two countries will result in great impact on the global market, and KRIT will actively support DAPA so that uh, we can have win-win situation as the host of uh, defense industry technology. Thank you so much.
talk about in this issue set, and unfortunately, we are out of time for today's public discussion. So if, if I can offer a very brief summary of what I've heard, it's that there is uh, a great deal and increasing alignment between the United States and Korea on the importance of supply chains and the, the thinking about what we need to do to get to the next level. Uh, there is a growing interest and commitment to collaboration on S&T, on co-development, and downstream efforts from that, and that there is as a result of both of those, growing cooperation, not just at the operational level, which I think we've been doing for 60 and 70 years, but at the industrial and the thinking level, which have been uh, slower to catch up. And so that leaves me very optimistic that our uh, Alliance 3.0 is, is moving ahead and may soon hit a tipping point to an Alliance 4.0, whatever that looks like. But please, help me say thank you to our presenters and our panelists. And that concludes this morning's session.